You're listening to the LA Football Podcast. What is going on, Los Angeles? Welcome to the LA Football Show. Happy, what, Cyber Monday? I guess post-Thanksgiving weekend to everyone out there. Hope everyone had a blessed holiday with friends and family. Got to eat some some delicious turkey, uh, some great fixins and stuff like that. Had a fun football weekend in college and the pros, which we are going to get all into today, specifically right now, our USC Trojans, but we'll have segments for all four of our LA football teams that you can find on the LA Football Network, all of our individual LAFB YouTube channels as well. Just search you know, UCLA, USC, Rams, and Chargers. You can find them there, or just go to lafbnetwork.com to find everything you need. I'm your co-host, Ryan Dyer, joined as always by Jamal Badney. What's up, brother? How you doing? How was your Thanksgiving weekend? Doing well, Ry. Excited to jump into it with you after a, a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. My wife got the chance to host Thanksgiving for the first time with our family, so it was fun-filled, action-packed, and she worked a lot harder than I did. Um, although I, I kind of came in in that 11th hour doing some interesting things with turkeys that I had never done before. Let's just <laughs> let's just say I. Uh, I knew our turkey intimately well when uh, when it came down to kind of giblets and things of that nature. But uh, overall, uh, just a wonderful Thanksgiving break. Uh, hope you had a terrific one with the family as well. And excited to talk about the the last week uh, of the college football regular season. Yeah, yeah, it was a great, great holiday. I, we talked a little offline, but I don't think we talked online. Do you have a, what's your, excuse me, what's your favorite thanksgiving dish i can't believe we didn't talk about that last week and is there any indian flair or flavor that your i know your wife was in charge of thanksgiving this year but in general is there any kind of indian flavor that you guys add to the thanksgiving meal yeah no it's um i you know i love the stuffing i i love my uh you know my wife's my mother-in-law stuffing uh that that's sort of homemade my father-in-law is also the avid uh chef and so big fan of that we try and we've experimented. Let me put it this way. We've experimented since marriage about adding some Indian elements to, uh, to the Thanksgiving cuisine. But uh, the challenge that we face, Ryan, in our family is the spice tolerance varies quite a bit. You know, between my side of the family and my wife's side of the family, it is uh, quite the wide disparity in uh, in spice tolerance. So it makes it a little <laughs> bit challenging in that regard. So we're still trying to figure out what that right kind of Indian element is uh, to uh, to the overall Thanksgiving dinner, but uh, we'll get there. Yeah. Well, we'd be in this, if my family lived out here, we'd be in the same boat, uh, but I'm the, <laughs> I'm the only white guy at Thanksgiving because I'm all with my wife's family. So we go by their spice uh, um, table, I guess you will, which I love spicy foods. So um Mine, if it's not turkey, I love turkey. If it's not turkey, I'd go green bean casserole. I love green bean casserole. Um, I've made it a few years. My wife's made it the last couple of years. Um, but one fun like Mexican thing that we do, or my wife's family does, is they always do jalapeno poppers. Is like one of the the side dishes, usually like an hors d'oeuvre before the main meal, which is fantastic. And then just one tiny element, but it's so good. And I've been trying to preach this now since we've been we've been married five years together, eight or whatever. And the first time I discovered it was the first when we were dating and I went up to Thanksgiving since I my folks are out of town. And my mother-in-law makes a phenomenal red salsa. They just call it red chili. And it's uh, really, really good, really spicy, but great flavor. And instead, you can do both. But instead of gravy on turkey, you just put the salsa on the turkey. And it is fantastic makes the turkey that much better even afterwards when i'm doing my my leftovers and i do the hawaiian roll with turkey and mayo i still put that salsa on top so that's the main kind of mexican flair that my wife's family does on thanksgiving and it's fantastic love that oh man bringing an added dimension over there oh, yeah. i'm jealous i think we gotta we gotta figure out how we can sort of merge the two families together one year and do a, a massive mexican indian uh, Thanksgiving uh, dinner. That would be amazing. Oh, that would, yeah, that'd be great. We might need to call that a whole new holiday altogether. Not Thanksgiving. Yeah. If we do it in the Mexican Passover, that'd be great. I, I, it's funny. I tweeted out and it took me like a day to even re- like understand what this guy was responding. But I tweeted that out. Like if you haven't put chili over your Turkey, you're missing out. And someone responded to me and just said, okay. And then it was a f- 
turkey flag and then a, or excuse me, a chili flag and then a turkey flag. And I was so confused, but it, it was a great, great response. Great tweet. Um, so definitely enjoyed that. But before we get into this, because I'm really excited, Jamal, to talk about this USC game. We're both at it. Great game against Notre Dame. Excited about the future of this. Uh, but quickly, obviously got to mention our sponsor of the show, Bet Online. Head to betonline.ag today. Use the promo code BELIEVE. That's B-L-E-A-V. You get a 50% welcome bonus on your first time deposit. That is free money to play with. Obviously, huge game on Friday in Vegas between USC and Notre Dame, and you can put some money on it to wager if you are not going out to Vegas for it. Once again, that's betonline.ag. You can do it on mobile or desktop. Promo code BELIEVE for your 50% welcome bonus. Make sure to check them out. BetOnline.ag, where the game starts. So, Jamal, we were both at the Collie. Great atmosphere. 70,000 plus in the stands. It was electric even from the press box. I could feel it. Finally, been waiting all year. This team has been so good all year, and it took this huge rival between the other name to really fill it up. But I think now, the way this season's gone, going in the next year, we will see this every game from here on out, which is very exciting. Um, it was definitely the place to be in the presser afterwards. Obviously we're going to get to the game, but the presser afterwards, I mean, it was palpable. All the players, coach Riley, they all said it like, man, it was so awesome seeing the Coliseum like that. Um, coach Riley obviously has been in some big guy, big time games down in Norman. Uh, he's had his stadium filled all the times. And this isn't a shot at LA fans, or at least it's not intended to be, but he hasn't truly felt what an LA true fan base can be until this past Saturday. And it was really exciting to see. And it was just a fun, fun atmosphere and obviously a great football game. Like I said, I was in the press box, you were in the stands. So how much better was it from your vantage point? No, Ryan, you could feel, I mean, it was a palpable difference this year. For the first time, it felt a little bit like the old days again. It has still we're not we're not yet at that Pete Carroll level of, of 02 to 08 when, with the way the collie was packed. But it definitely felt like some of the Sam Darnold years. I remember one game in particular, that USC Texas game when Texas came to town and in 2017, and the place was absolutely rocking, and it felt very much like that. I think what also made it so electric, Ryan, is a significant amount of USC fans. Not a ton of Notre Dame fans out there traveling, maybe 10,000 at the most, and they were all really spread out. And so I think it was a little bit ironic because all week it didn't really feel like a rivalry game. It was very quiet on social media, relatively speaking. It was very quiet in terms of national telecast and exposure of this game. It was just sort of an under-the-radar type of rivalry game. And so for that game to now have the electric atmosphere in the crowd, I think it really is an incredible way to cap off this 2022 season. So the next time we are all together in the Collie in September of 23, hopefully we just pick up right where we left off, and it's going to be 70,000-plus in the Collie every game, every home game and really building upon all the greatness from this year. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I got I got one statement on that, and then I got one question for you before we dive into the game. Um, one, you said it. I was surprised, actually, that the lack of Notre Dame fans because, you know, I'm not I, – I'm well-traveled. I, I know a decent amount about where fan bases are around the country, and I would argue that outside of South Bend, Indiana, maybe the largest con concentration of Notre Dame fans are in Southern California. I mean, just a ton of people either from SoCal go to Notre Dame and then move back or after graduating Notre Dame, get jobs out here and live in Southern California. I know a lot. I'm sure there's other places, so I'm not quoting that. That's just from what I've seen. So I just assumed going into this game, it was going to be a lot of Notre Dame fans. Obviously, just being in L.A. covering football, you see a lot of opposing fans in general, depending whatever team that we're covering. And so I was, A, impressed, but B, just more shocked that it was 95 to 96% as C fans over Notre Dame. So I thought that was super cool. I mean, like you said, even any green you saw, it was just spackled all over. There wasn't even a concentrated like student section. I mean, we've seen, we've seen Cal travel better. I know that's closer in proximity, but Cal's not a good football program. Notre Dame is. So I was actually very surprised that there was not more so in that. So that was, I think, cool to see in terms of just the USC um, output and showing out for this game. And my question for you, and you said it, three times while just talking right there. So I assume it's the case, but I have, because I didn't go there. I've always called the Coliseum the Collie. I just think it sounds cool. It's short. I've heard a few guys on radio call it. 
but I've heard from many older USC alum that it is like sacrilegious to call it the Cauley. It's like, no, it's always the Coliseum. And I'm not arguing with him. I didn't go there, but I've, I've heard literal alumni call it the Cauley. My good friend Frosty Rucker has called it the Cauley. Is it true that it's not ever called the Cauley around campus? Or is that just maybe in that certain subsect where those fans are from? Because I just, I'm just curious. I want to get to the bottom of this, Jamal. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's, it, it isn't really called the Cauley um, uh, historically. I think that's kind of been a fun colloquialism that I've heard over the last year much in the way when LeBron went back to Cleveland the second time, everybody started calling Cleveland the land, the land. And it just sort of caught on. It feels like the Cauley is sort of catching on in that way. I started um, it. It hasn't sort of historically been there. You've started it. And I think we need to actually <laughs> spin up a Cauley shirt for LAFB and really claim those rights uh, moving forward because I think that's going to be important uh, to, for LAFB to stake that claim. Um, but, you know, I think it's also interesting with the USC fan base being more traditional sometimes. There's been a lot of criticism with the towel guys and there's been a lot of criticism with the DJ. And one of the, the big criticisms from this this game was the fact that the band didn't really get an opportunity to play very much at halftime because of all of these other elements. So the purists are very strong at USC the John McKay purists. Um, and so I think it's interesting to see how things emerge over time. The one interesting thing, Ryan, I want to bring up about the earlier point. You know, this was the first time Notre Dame played SC in four years since 2018. And so much has happened. Because remember, that 2020 game didn't happen. And all the other times it's been at Notre Dame. And think about how much has happened in our world from a global pandemic uh, standpoint and how much movement there has been in our country. So many people have moved to different locations with virtual work and the future of work. And I actually think the concentration of Notre Dame fans just doesn't exist in LA anymore. I think a lot of folks have moved out of the city um, as a result of COVID and job opportunities and virtual work and all of that. And so I think there's sort of an interesting connection there. First time post pandemic or post COVID-19, I should say, that Notre Dame visits USC and it's a completely different crowd. I think the composition of the Notre Dame fan base, specifically on the West Coast, has really changed permanently. That's, uh, that's a great point. And obviously a small sample size, but three of my good friends that are diehard Notre Dame fans no longer live here. I think they all live in Idaho, or I know one of them for sure lives in Idaho. So, And that was even pre-COVID. That was just marriage and family decisions. But um, that could certainly be a case. And last thing about the Cauley and – this is what, what made me proud is Coach Riley called the Collie in the press yeah. conference. His <laughs> quote literally was, man, it was great seeing the Collie like that and great seeing this fans." So, hey, if Coach Riley calls it the Collie, then I think we can put this to bed. But our good friend, friend of the show, Rich Hammond at the Athletic uh, USC alum, great dude, love him. But me and him always go back and forth because he's the one I re- he's the one I really made it known to me because I just not going there of him saying like, man, it's not called the Collie, it's the Coliseum. I'm like, well, Rich, if Coach says it, now it's called the Collie. So, yes, and I sir. agree. We have shirts coming soon. Now, I think those are definitely already in the works. I wish we could get them before Vegas. Uh, maybe we'll see if we can do something out. So, um, but Jamal, let's get into this game. 38 um, 27. You might feel differently. I personally don't think it even felt that close. I know uh, it was kind of back and forth a little bit, and USC would take a bigger lead, Notre Dame would make it closer. But to me, it felt like more of an 11 point margin, just the way that SC controlled the game throughout. A lot of great plays, a lot of great playmakers. Obviously, Caleb Williams had a f- fantastic game yet again, uh, more so with his uh, you know legs this time necessarily than his arm, but still did stuff with his arm, dazzled, all this good stuff. I'm going to get into him and, and the Heisman run, but just overall, Jamal, your overall thoughts. We talked about the crowd, the environment, but just the play on the field. How did you feel about this game? Because you know, two weeks ago before the UCLA game, we were both fairly critical, man. This team did not look great against you know a, a very poorly playing Cal team didn't look great against a Colorado team. And now back-to-back weeks beating UCLA and beating Notre Dame. I think we can both safely say this team looks and has arrived, but your overall thoughts from this game. Yeah, Ryan, I think you, you said it very well. Two things really stood out to me. One is the run defense. I thought that for all of the talk coming in of Notre Dame's physicality and wanting to pound the rock, I thought the run defense did an absolutely phenomenal job. I think what back to Notre Dame's first possession, third and two, Notre Dame kind of tries this jet sweep 
gets blown up by Shane Lee for a loss of three. And everything Notre Dame tried to do over the course of the game in terms of running the football, nothing came easy. And so that much maligned USC defense, especially on the run earlier this year, really came up huge and was quite significant. And obviously Caleb Williams is the headliner, and I'm sure we'll dedicate the next <laughs> three weeks to Caleb Williams. But I thought the other individual that was absolutely phenomenal was Austin Jones. 25 carries, 154 yards. The bell cow that we were really waiting for. And he gives this team a dimension that even Travis Dye couldn't, which is that ability to be durable and be a 20-plus carry back. That was always the one knock on Travis Dye for as great as he was out of the backfield and receiving the ball and the versatility. Could he take the pounding given his frame in a game where you needed a feature back to go for 20-plus carries? Austin Jones was able to answer that mail absolutely seamlessly. So I loved what I saw out of USC. And interestingly enough, Ryan, it, you said it. It felt like it was a bigger margin of victory. But the game was kind of played on Notre Dame's terms. You know, the first half, USC only had the ball four times. Notre Dame only had the ball three times. So both teams were chewing a lot of clock, slowing the pace down. And I think the game completely changed on that Drew Pine fumble. Uh, you know, that was the, the play that, that ended the game, essentially. Because if Notre Dame punches that in, it's 17-14 with eight minutes to go in the third quarter, and the game is very much being played on Notre Dame's terms in terms of time and pace. So I think we were in for a really interesting end, uh, much in the same way we were, I think, headed for a very interesting end against Fresno State all the way back in, in early in the season. That Drew Pine muffed RPO. The guy didn't even you know, lose it on the mesh. The, you know, the running back ran away. He just had the ball. He just dropped the ball. Uh, it, it was absolutely unreal, and, and that was all she wrote because then it, the game just kept fluctuating. USC up 17, USC up 10, USC up 17, USC up 10. Never threatened again. Very end up 31-21, and that ball hawk yet again, Kalen Bullock, with the game ceiling interception. So overall, I was very pleased with what I saw, more specifically in USC's ability to play successfully on someone else's terms. And on other terms of slowing the ball, chewing clock and whatnot. And it just adds another layer of versatility to this otherwise all-worldly potent offense. Yeah. I, you know, I've got a few overarching thoughts on this game. And, and I'll start with where you started or you seconded with Austin Jones. And, and for how great Caleb Williams is and was and will be and what we will like you said dedicate not only the next three weeks but probably the next 15 minutes after this on this show to um if i'm giving out game balls my number one game ball is going to austin jones i mean the dude was phenomenal like you mentioned the stat line there 25 carries 150 plus yards but his vision was so great in between the tackles so strong so powerful when you needed the the small little yards he would get it when you were on first down and wanted a gash play, he'd give it to you there. And I think this is taking absolutely nothing away from Travis Dye because he was so important to this offense and he was so good and still is very much missed. But I don't think anyone anticipated them to still be able to run the ball with, when you look at statistically, just as much, if not more success since he's gone down after handing the keys over to Austin Jones. So I think that's been the impressive things from the offensive line perspective, from the play calling perspective, and then just from Austin Jones perspective of really seizing the opportunity and for lack of better words, running with it and doing a very, very good job in doing so. And, you know, making that transfer from Stanford look fantastic. So huge, huge game for Austin Jones. It was just every time I had the ball, you're like, you're, you're getting a minimum of four or five yards. You just you knew it was coming. And against the Notre Dame defensive front that is very well, highly regarded in NCAA in, a, in uh, Notre Dame's defense overall, I believe was 11th in overall total defense coming into this game may have even been top 10. Maybe they dropped to 11 after this game. Cause I looked afterwards and gave up their first 400 yard performance of the season. I mean, USC total over 430 total yards in this one uh, on the ground and passing. And the point I take from that, and these are where I get to my two overarching points is one so much always about the PAC 12, which I'm going to get to later on. In a, in a minute here too, but just in general with the Pac-12 and specifically this USC team is West Coast, it's finesse. They can't hang with the big boys in the Big Ten or Notre Dame or the SEC. They're not big enough. They, they're they not smash mouth enough. They're not nastiest, nasty enough. 
and they just went toe to toe with the big boys at Notre Dame and, and smashed them for the tune of 437 yards. They held them to less yards. They held their running game to under a hundred yards. So I think that's a big, big takeaway in this that we said before Jamal, that I think this Notre Dame team was a little bit overranked, still a good football team, but probably a little overranked with who they've played, but still defensively a good team. Obviously Morgan Freeman, not Morgan Freeman, uh, coach Freeman, uh, Mike Freeman, right? Uh, Marcus. Marcus. Thank you. I knew it was an M Marcus <laughs> Freeman, uh, very well-respected coach, great defensive mind. So they have all that going for him. But, you know, maybe a little highly ranked, but still the fact that USC was able to, like you said, play with Notre Dame's terms and still put up that kind of offensive production while still playing sound, fundamental football on defense. Yeah, they gave up some plays, which we knew was going to happen. We know is going to happen moving forward. That's what this defense is. But they got their two turnovers. They got their four to five stops in this one. And they really came out on top in that regard. So I was very pleased that um, they were able to play to the tone of what the national media says they couldn't do and were able to do. And my last point on defense is, is this, and yes, they ended up giving up, you know, 27 total points and about 400, I think in two total yards. So it wasn't a flawless defensive performance by any means, but I think they looked a lot better than a lot of people are given credit for. And the other point I think I take away from is PAC 12 offenses are a lot better than what the national media gives credit for. I think that, we're from top to maybe 11, maybe we can take out Colorado, but from top to 11, all 11 schools can really move the ball and are really creative in their offensive thinking in the Pac-12. And that's my initial thought in the first half was exactly that. This defense is a lot better than people are giving credit for. And I think it shows because Pac-12 offenses are just a lot better than what people give credit for. So those were kind of my big takeaways uh, from this one, Jamal, just a, just a fantastic win for this program moving forward. And I think it just builds upon their resume, which we're going to get into later in the week about what they have going on down in Vegas. Yeah, Ryan, I think those are some excellent points. And I think another point is when you have such a potent offense as USC does, arguably the best offense in America, it does two things for you. One is it relaxes your defense because you know they don't have to play a perfect game not far from it, they could basically give up points, they can give up yards, and the offense has their back. You've said it all year, give me four stops, I'll give you a natty. I mean, that's basically the gist there. But I think what it does is on the other side, I think it forces you to get out of character. And if I were to describe Marcus Freeman in this game, Ryan, I think he overcoached himself into a loss. And the reason I say that is, he tried to do all kinds of different things because he felt like he needed a lot of weapons to be alive and engaged to be able to go score for score with USC over the course of four quarters. Case in point, I don't know why Notre Dame didn't throw the ball to Michael Mayer every time. He was targeted <laughs> eight times, eight catches, 98 yards, two touchdowns. The guy did whatever he wanted to do. USC has not solved the tight end issue by any stretch of the imagination. It would have been a Dalton Kincaid 2.0 situation if they just kept feeding him the ball. And But Freeman went away from that. He tried to get other receivers involved, tried to get other backs involved, wanted to do some different things, RPOs like we mentioned, and just different looks because he felt like he needed a lot of horses in the race to keep up shot for shot with USC. And so... That's how potent this offense is, not just for what it does directly in terms of the scoreboard, but it relaxes the USC defense. But sometimes it can take other offenses just completely out of character because they don't think they can rely on one or two players or one or two plays consistently over four quarters to be able to beat and outscore USC. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I was... Um... Early in that game, I was like watching Michael Meyer and I'm like, oh, here we go. This is this is gonna be a long one. But you know, like you said, I think it was some some yeah, adjustments on defense. Stop him, Ryan. I mean, let's no. not get it twisted. He, I mean, he had eight catches on eight targets. They just didn't throw him the ball enough. So I, that's gonna be really interesting segueing into next week here with Utah, because I'm pretty sure Whittingham is not gonna have that problem. He's gonna keep Milk and Kincaid. And so I'm really excited about that matchup, but not to get too ahead of ourselves. Yeah, that I mean that's that's going to be the game if what they do for them next week. So, um, 
let's kind of end with this. And well, I, obviously we got to talk about Caleb Williams and, and kind of the future of this team and, and, you know, the college football playoff talks, which everyone's obviously talking about and Those new rankings will come out on Tuesday. So we'll be curious to see if they do jump into four with the Ohio state loss and whatnot and the LSU loss. Um, but it's funny. Let's start with, let's start with Caleb a little bit. Then we'll talk college football playoff and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But it's, it's funny. I was thinking Jamal, we, we talked, I don't know, three, four weeks ago about this. We did a video on LA football network about this, maybe even longer than that. To be honest, we talked about how Caleb Williams reminds us of the only iteration again, not saying he's as good yet, but has similarities to that of Patrick Mahomes mentioned it a long time ago. No one really talked about that. It's funny how all it took was a 430 primetime kickoff with Chris Fowler and Kirk Herbstreet. And all of a sudden, every media member in America is saying, man, Caleb Williams just look, looks like Patrick Mahomes out there. I swear I saw 40 tweets, Jamal, on Saturday night of all these different media personalities saying it like they just spewed it for the very first time. We've been talking about it for over a month. But I think that says two things. One, we're probably right. We know what we're talking about. But B, and, and I try not to sound like a homer or bias here, but it's like it is so real, the West Coast bias, the the late start times, the old historical narratives of this conference being weak and whatnot, that it took till the 12th game of the season for everyone to wake up and say, oh, USC is actually pretty good. And oh, this Caleb Williams guy might be the next Pat Mahomes. It took 12 weeks for that. And it's just, it's frustrating in the sense it's not, I mean, whatever we can find the right. It is what it is, but it's frustrating that now everyone's like just showing pause of this. When we all along have been saying these seven thirty start times are so bad for these programs. Chip Kelly said it a bunch of times, like he doesn't care. They'll play whenever, but it's so bad for these kids and their recognition, their scouting, all of it, because no one sees it other than the actual fans of that team. And this was such a perfect example of that when now everyone's on board the Caleb Williams USC train when it's like they could have been on board since October and they're just now realizing. No, Ryan, I think you said it best. And Caleb was sensational, 18-22, 232 yards, a passing touchdown. And then the beautiful keepers for the three rushing touchdowns, nine carries, 35 yards. He was so terrific. He was so efficient. He was so improvisational as he always is in terms of dropping back, reading the defenses, twirling around. You know, what's so impressive to me about him is how he backpedals, you know, as a scrambler. Like, he doesn't even, like, turn his body and turn his shoulder around. He just sort of backpedals. And it's just unbelievable how he can maintain that balance and the poise. And you know what's ironic, Ryan? You said it best about the primetime game. I don't know if this was even a top five Caleb Williams game this year. And it, it, it just sort of an average ho-hum Caleb Williams performance to make the Pat Mahomes comparisons to say, look, the Heisman is done, signed, sealed, and delivered, put a bow on it. C.J. Stroud choked. Blake Corum got hurt. Hendon Hooker's out for the season. This is a done deal. Caleb Williams is the 2022 Heisman Trophy winner and USC's eighth Heisman Trophy winner in history. And all it took was one 430 game and an average performance by his standards for him to become rightfully so the national media darling as the best player in college football. So no question about it, Ryan. There is a tremendous bias here with West Coast football. Let's hope we can change some of that narrative in bowl season, possibly in the CFP, because I think the stigma, Ryan, of that Georgia-Oregon game is still ringing very mm -hmm. loud. And in addition to the stigma of that Florida-Utah game, you know, when you yep. talk about a Florida team that's seventh or eighth or ninth in the SEC beating a team we thought is, you know, top two, three, and guess what? Here they are now in the Pac-12 title game and being able to beat them. I think that really hurt the Pac-12 even more than the normal bias. So let's hope we can reestablish ourselves in bowl season and the postseason and really put this baby to bed going into next year. Yeah, I mean, it's so important, and that that is how you can start silencing people is taking care of business when it comes to the playoffs, not just necessarily the college football playoff, but the extra games in these bowl seasons. And, and yeah, I actually tweeted that out earlier that, unfortunately, when you start the season with the two big juggernauts in the pack at the time, SC wasn't there yet, losing, it just 
further led more into those historical narratives that three fourths of the country had, and then they just stopped paying attention and now they see it here. Um, and so that's, that's the unfortunate thing, but it just shows that it plays into that. The media doesn't do a lot to help. So, but Hey, how you do that? Like you said, win your bowl games, which, uh, you know what, we're going to have eight PAC 12 teams in bowl games. So it's a huge opportunity for this, this conference to kind of shed light on that and hopefully improve on that. And, you know, the last thing I'll, I'll say on that, and then we can move into the bowl and, and then wrap up. But, you know, I, I still to this day and we get him, you know, always we'll, we'll take the free engagement and the free views and whatever. But I see it on Twitter and I see it on um, on YouTube, too, in, in our comments. And even still, after the UCLA performance, you can go back to the Utah performance, the Arizona performance and then this Notre Dame performance you still have people creeping in from the SEC or the Big Ten, and granted, they're fans of their team, but throwing out names, not not even saying C.J. Stroud, Hedden Hooker, any of these, but throwing out names that have zero business even being in the same conversation, in the same breath as Caleb Williams. And that's no disrespect to these young men because they're working hard, but we're talking about the Heisman Trophy here. Like, what are we talking about? It's unbelievable. And even when you look at C.J. Stroud, Jamal, and this will be the perfect segue into kind of if USC winning, you if they beat Utah, which again, we'll get way into that more later in the week, getting into the CF, um, CFP. But even when you look at CJ Stroud and just Ohio State in general, they have played in this season three top 25 opponents. They've beaten two of them. One, week one against Notre Dame. Notre Dame is a very different football team then and now, but whatever, we'll give them the win. Two, Penn State. That is it. And then they got blown out on Saturday at home against Michigan. USC to this point has played three or played four, excuse me. No, played three, one, two, Oregon State no, at Oregon State. State. Played, played four, one, three. You Thank were right. You. Thank you. Played, yeah. So I was thinking potentially five. So they've played four, one, three at Oregon State, at UCLA, at Utah, all three on the road. They lost by one point to Utah. Obviously, the Heisman talk for Caleb, that resume is way stronger than CJ. And then the team talk for the college football playoff. Like, how is it even a question still? If this team wins out, I believe, no doubt in my mind, they'll be in the top four. I, I think they may even go to three. But how is this even a conversation, Jamal, that Ohio State and others even have a chance to keep them out of it? I don't get it. You just look at the resumes. Just look at the resumes. That's all you need. No, Ryan, it makes no sense to me. And let's double down on that a little bit more. So, USC 3-1 and one against the top 25 wins Oregon State, UCLA, Notre Dame. The only loss, one point to Utah. Opportunity to avenge that loss. Ohio State, a very weak Penn State team. And let's call it a weaker Notre Dame team, 2-1. and one. But look at the way they just got their doors blown off by Michigan at home. But then let's go even further. The Pac-12 has six ranked teams. Not only does the Pac-12 have six ranked teams, the Pac-12 has six teams ranked in the top 17. UCLA's ranked 17th, and they're sixth in the Pac-12 this year. I mean, this is how loaded and this Jamal. conference is. And Jamal, not to cut you off, but just if UCLA and Oregon State win their bowl games, there'll be six 10-win teams in the Pac-12. That's exactly I mean, right. This has been the greatest year in the history of the Pac-12 since its inception and people just don't realize the depth of this conference year over year, and in particular this year. There is no doubt in my mind, Ryan, that USC, all they have to do is win by one point against Utah, and they are in the top four. Now I think where it becomes interesting is if they win big, and let's say TCU you know, skates by in their game, is there an opportunity to sort of flip that? and have SC jump to number three versus a TCU being at four. But win and therein, there's absolutely no argument in my mind. I think the only argument that enters, Ryan, is if USC were to lose, then what happens? And I actually think the biggest beneficiary there will not be Ohio State. I think Ohio State has left too bad a taste in your mouth. When the last time you're on, your, on the field, you end up losing by 22 at home, that's just too much of a narrative gap to overcome, even if it's one loss. I think if USC were to lose to Utah, I think the biggest beneficiary would be Alabama. Alabama will sneak in 
to that number four slot because they only have two losses by a combined four points. But that's neither here nor there. SC wins. They're in. No doubt in my mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I would think not many people would argue that. I would, I would hope if they win, that's then four wins against top twenty-five, avenging the one loss. Um, you know, the special season having the Heisman probable winner on the roster and all that. So it's, it, yeah, it's just it, it's wild to me these even thoughts and conversations. And I mean, it'd be one thing, Jamal, if Ohio State and obviously we're we're hammering down on Ohio State here, but it'd be one thing if they had like this horrible loss, but they had five top 25 wins. Then I'm like, I still wouldn't agree with it, but it's like, okay, you can understand. They have two and they're not even like Notre Dame and Penn state. Like, it's not like they're like these overarching wild, big, big wins. Like, so it's, it's yeah. But I've I've seen some, like I saw a came out today. It was a college football playoff predictor. I can't remember if it was ESPN action network. I can't remember which one. So I, I apologize if I'm not saying it correctly. But it still had Ohio State as a higher percentage than USC to make the college football playoff. Like, so I don't know if that was just outdated info that just got posted today or what, because there's no way in my mind that has any chance, especially now that they are going to play a game less. How can you not play in your conference title game and a team that does play and wins? Obviously, we're assuming this all is with USA winning the conference. Where's you know, the, I don't, I'm speechless about that. ESPN predictor right now that the ESPN predictor right now only has a giving USC like a 35% chance to beat Utah. And so I think when you sort of aggregate that predictor and then say, Oh, if USC has two losses, then the probability of a one loss Ohio state jumps up. So I think that's what's going on, but I think it's really faulty logic with that regard. And I think really even beyond that, Ryan, the big 10 was just so weak this year. Uh, the, the game I go back to is Northwestern had Ohio State on the ropes through three quarters. Northwestern came into that game one and nine. The equivalent in the Pac-12 would be, could you imagine if Colorado was beating USC through three quarters this year? That is what the equivalent of what happened in the Big Ten with Northwestern beating Ohio State. So Ohio State demonstrated some fraudulent tendencies for a lot of this year. They had a very close game against Maryland as well. They've been shoddy. They've been spotty. This is not an elite Ohio State team. I think they have a couple of elite receivers and an elite thrower of the football. But overall, this is not an elite team. And I think if USC played Ohio State on a neutral field, I think USC wins by 10 plus. Love it. Love it. So, well, hopefully we will get to see USC and Michigan because that would be a fun one and just the history and, and all that good stuff. Obviously, USC winning a national title back in 03 against Michigan at the Rose Bowl. Uh, our good friend Lofa Tatupu being on that team. So it would be a lot of fun. But, hey, we're not there. Ryan, we gotta, one, we gotta... of my best, one of my best buds, Ushwin. Shout out to Ushwin. He's, he's a huge Michigan fan, and we have been dreaming about a scenario – where USC plays Michigan, either in the Rose Bowl. Never did we dream it would be the CFP so quickly. I told him that, you know, he's got two beautiful children under the age of three. I told him, I said, I'm going to kidnap you and take you to Glendale if it's USC Arizona. And his response to me this morning was, I'll hire 10 babysitters if I have to. But you and I are going to that game if it ends up being USC Michigan. The shout out to my boy, Ushwin. Yeah. Well, and hey, and maybe longer shot, if SC is the four, somehow beats Georgia, Michigan beats TCU the three, they're playing right here in SoFi for the Damn, game. There it Make is. It even easier, so you never know. <laughs> um, well, great. Well, hey, we got to get through Utah first. So let's not hear Utah's a very good team. Well, obviously, we're going to talk about it throughout the week. Jamal and I will be in Vegas at that game at Allegiant Stadium. Cannot wait to cover the game for you. We'll be doing recaps you know, from the hotel right after. We'll be doing stuff for So we're going to dive really into that game later in the week. Um, I had a lot of fun with this Notre Dame game. A lot of fun for this USC team. Um, you know, this is a, a special team. It's, it's, it's the culture that Lincoln Riley has built so quickly. The players that have bought him. Uh, they signed off their press conference, Jamal. And I think I've said this before because Caleb Williams have said this before. But he signed it off basically saying, because he was asked, what does leadership mean to you? And he said, the great teams, the players lead. The good teams, the coaches lead. And the average team, no one leads. I think we know where this team was last year. And I think now we know who is leading this team this year. And they have a great coach in Lincoln Riley to 
aid in the lead, and they have a great player base led by Caleb Williams that is leading this team, including Travis Dye, who's injured, including Austin Jones, including all these other guys, including some, you know, Tuli Tui Pelotu on defense, all these guys that are leading the right way. And that's why this team went from four and eight to 11 and one, and now playing for a Pac 12 title and an opportunity for the college football playoff in less than 365 days. It's remarkable, Jamal. Absolutely remarkable. No doubt about it, Ryan. And the one thing I want to say, this is a great opportunity for it. I was in the stands. I was with one of my buddies uh, from USC watching this game. And we looked down the Coliseum and we saw the six retired jerseys. And we were sort of contemplating how the Caleb Williams 13, where it should be placed in terms of for the best symmetry and the timeline and all. And I think USC has done, football has done a remarkable job with the hiring of Brandon Sozna and Mike Bone and going away from just having ex-players becoming ADs and then having that brass bring on Lincoln Riley with their home run scenario. There's one more thing left to do now. And because there's an opportunity to hang up one jersey, this is the time to hang up both jerseys. It is time to bring the Reggie Bush 5 back, retire it, retire it on opening day 2023 with the 13. Can you imagine the 13 and the 5 going up together as rightfully it should be to re-solidify USC with their eight Heisman Trophy winners? You want to sell out 76,000 strong in the first game in September? Go hang up 13 and 5 together. One more job to do for USC Athletics to really bring this thing home. Yeah, that would be special. That would be special. And there's a photo that came out just a few days ago of Caleb with Matt Leinert and Reggie Bush. It was so cool. It was, I mean, Amon Ross St. Brown going to the Thanksgiving game with the Lions wearing the Caleb 13. Like the brand of SC football is back, which I think is so, so cool to see. Great for the school, obviously, but great for LA. I mean, it's great for LA. And finally, this last weekend, which we alluded to, we finally saw it in the stadium. We've been seeing it around. We've been hearing on the airwaves, but we saw it in the stadium. And now let's just keep building on that and stacking and stacking and going right last thing i'm gonna say here because i'm i'm pumped up i'm fired up being being an alum of sc as well the rams and the chargers got their work cut out for them because la's football team is back now and so we talk a lot about the window of opportunity for ucla football and that window being potentially closed because sc is back let me tell you something the rams and the chargers it, you you better bring the lunch pail now and, and wear your protective cup and really make sure that you're going to be elite year over year because make no mistake about it, L.A.'s football team is the USC Trojans. And when they're humming, so hums L.A. in a way that is not galvanized by any other team. So the gauntlet has been passed. It's time for the Rams and the Chargers to up their game as well. And here's how you do that. One, which we've said now for a month, Rams, go get Caleb Williams in the draft in two years. <laughs> That's one way to do it. And two, for the Chargers specifically this year, the season's over in a week. You still have six or seven more games as the pro team. That's when you galvanize the fan base and keep them wanting more because there is no SC football on on Saturdays anymore. So we're on the same team. It's all LA football. It's a beautiful <laughs> thing. We will be in Vegas in less than a week at Allegiant Stadium. Cannot wait, my friend. We're, uh, we're pumped to get out there and uh, provide some good content. So thank you all for tuning in. This is the LA football show. Make sure to like, and subscribe to the show, wherever you get your podcast on YouTube, uh, USC LAFB or on the website, LAFBnetwork.com. Everyone be well, be safe. We'll talk to y'all soon. Fight on.